Today, my wife and I are visiting at Colonial Williamsburg, an amazing living history museum in Virginia that tells the early part of America's enduring story. Come along with me and my wife as we explore a history buff's paradise. That's coming up next. of the city of Williamsburg, my dear, dear friends, please allow me an introduction. The name is General Lafayette, though I believe that most of you probably know me far better by my name of the French aristocracy of the nobility of the second estate, as we call it back in France. And that, of course, is Marie Joseph Pauli Branchelbert du Montier, le Marquis de Lafayette. Would you like to repeat that, madame? <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure and honor it is to see all of you here on this simply magnificent day, already this 12th day of April of the year 1784. But a day of celebration, is it not? Yes. 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 How I will always love you, Americans. For in reality, you have no idea of what I am celebrating, yet many of you are willing to celebrate right along with me. Do you know, I think that is a credit to the American people how very optimistic you are, or perhaps in want of a party. Well, how could you know, my dear friends, for I, General Lafayette, have only recently returned back to America after nearly three long years. Indeed, my friends, the last time I set foot upon American soil, was just after the great siege of Yorktown, which of course concluded 12 miles down the road. And on that fateful day, the 19th day of October of the year 1781, little did we know at that time, it would in fact be the greatest victory in the war. But more importantly than that single victory at Yorktown is the fact that but a few short months ago, in September of 1783, the Treaty of Paris has indeed been signed, thus making you, the people of America, officially free and independent. So, dear friends, I would say that is most assuredly a cause for celebration. So on this occasion, let us never forget how that independence was in fact achieved for all of those brave soldiers and civilians alike who fought and bled upon countless battlefields to achieve American freedom, let us applaud them all! <laughs> oh, my friends, how my heart is filled with joy at returning to see all of you, my beloved brothers and sisters here in America. But I must admit now that upon my return, I am reminded of what first inspired me to cross the great ocean and take part in this noble crusade. For friends, I, I recall I first heard of this noble cause back in 1775. <laughs> I was but a sous-lieutenant, a second lieutenant newly promoted to the rank of captain. In truth, only because my father-in-law owned the regiment. <laughs> so it was a bit of a wedding gift. Well, there I had found myself billeted in the eastern part of France, in a city known as Metz. And as was commonplace back then, we would often have these grandiose dinner parties with all of the most noble officers and attendants. And there we would typically speak about the various subjects of the day. Perhaps a war that had begun, a war that had concluded, a new treaty that had been signed, perhaps a new innovation in strategy or in tactics. But on one occasion we had a very special guest, and this guest was none other than the Duke of Gloucester. Yes, the same name applied to that route principale right here in Williamsburg. And well, who is the Duke of Gloucester? Well, he happens to be the brother to George III, the King of England. And we soon discovered that this man was rather sympathetic to the American cause. In fact, many were of the opinion that he thought America should be free and independent. So we all listened in on what he had to say. 
Of course, those present there that evening are, are men you know quite well. Uh, the Duc de Broy, who commanded in that region. Some of you might remember him from his exploits during the Seven Years' War. And do you know that some said that he was going to be given command of the Continental Army in the place of General Washington? Now, the Duc de Broy is a fine officer, to be sure. But I think we are all thankful that General Washington remained in command. Are we not? Oh, of course we are. There was my beloved friend, Baron de Colme, the one man perhaps most responsible for bringing me here to America. I can still recall receiving the dispatch of the news of his death. After the Battle of Camden in August of 1780, most distressful to me, but even more so to the great cause of American freedom, for he, he was such a fine officer. There was, of course, the Chevalier de Buisson. Madame, the Chevalier de Buisson. <laughs> what a coincidence, Madame. My dear friends, this is truly amazing. Do you know Madame danced recently a minuet with the Chevalier at the last of the Queen's birthday parties, wasn't it, Madame? Oh, you are being quite shy and quite humble, Madame. You are still the talk of Versailles. Madame danced the most intricate, difficult minuet I have ever seen dance before. Do you recall the name? Oh, how could you forget? <laughs> it was called Le Dauphin. Perfectly stepped, not one error, madame. You must have worked with your dance master for weeks, if not months. And upon conclusion of that perfect minuet, what did the queen say to you? C'est magnifique. It is magnificent. And you know very well the queen never gives compliments to anyone. <laughs> but herself. Oh, do you know, madame, if only I could find a few musicians here today, we could all see an example of that minuet. Would you like that, my friends? <laughs> oh, alas, madame, I, I don't see any musicians this morning. It's too early for them. <laughs> Another time. But, madame, you are still the talk of Versailles. <laughs> Forgive me, friends. I have veered off the course of my story. Let me return. So that evening, we spoke of many subjects to include the fighting at Lexington and at Concord, the Grand Congress in Philadelphia, and of course, the great man himself, that of General Washington. So it was by the conclusion of this meeting that I told my brother officers that I was ready and willing to fight and if need be, die for this cause. Now, I, I know what you're all thinking. Why, Monsieur le Marquis, why would you want to go and fight, and perhaps die, in another man's war. For France and England were not at war. <laughs> at that moment, <laughs> why would you want to risk yourself in such an endeavor? Well, I think you know the answer to that question. For this had been a war like none other in the history of man. Had it not? A war of great ideas, of the freedom, even the liberation of mankind a war that it embraced the ideas of the great thinkers of this, well, enlightened age, this age of reason, with men like Voltaire and Rousseau and Montesquieu, these people who believe that a man, no matter what station in life they might be born, whether they be black or white, Catholic or Protestant, rich or poor, slave or free, should not make a difference, but simply by the way in which that person would carry themselves and prove themselves in this world. My dear friends, after these many years of war, are you still in agreement with these great ideas? Well, I am pleased to hear it, for as am I, and as I shall continue to be until my dying day. So that evening, I rose up from my chair, I drew my sword, I came towards my host, the Duc de Broy, and told him I was ready to put my colors to this great and noble cause. But <laughs> you know what he said to me? Sit down, Monsieur le Marquis. I, I do believe you've had a bit too much wine this evening. <laughs> but friends, it was not the wine. It was simply my enthusiasm for this great and noble cause. So what could I do? Well. I did think about it for several days, and then I said to myself, ah, alas, I shall go to Versailles. I shall present myself at court in front of the king 
and the Queen of France, that of Louis XVI, Louis XVI, and of course Marie Antoinette, and ask if I might take part in this noble crusade. So off I go to Versailles, presenting myself at court in front of the king and the queen, asking them if I can take part in this grand adventure. And what do they say to me? You've got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> Well, no chance at all. <laughs> they say no. They say, je regrette, Monsieur le Marquis, cela n'est pas possible. C'est un moment très, quand la France et l'Angleterre ne sont pas en guerre. Je ne souhaite pas pour vous commencer une. I'm sorry, Monsieur le Marquis, it is just not possible. For it is indeed a rare time in French history where France and England are not at war. And I do not wish for you to start yet another war with that horrible, nation of merchants, as they referred to England back then. Well, my friends, that should have been the end of it. For when the king and queen of France say you cannot do something, you cannot. But I did the unthinkable. I disobeyed. I left my regiment. I went to the western part of France and there at the port city of Bordeaux, I purchased a ship fittingly called La Victoire, the Victory. For that is what I was in search of. Well, of course, the king and queen of France soon found out that I, the Marquis de Lafayette, had disobeyed them, and, well, do you think they were pleased with this? Au oh, contraire, they were quite displeased. In fact, so much so, they sent out soldiers we called the gendarmerie. So I was to be arrested and returned back to my regiment, or worse, to my father-in-law at Marseille. So I had to act with the utmost secrecy, preparing all that I would need, a crew to man my ship, companions to join me, all of the supplies that I would need, for in truth, I did not know when, or if I would even return back to France. When? When all was prepared. The harbor master at Bordeaux inquired, what is your destination, monsieur? Where are you headed? Not realizing, of course, at that moment that I was the Marquis de Lafayette, for of course I had disguised myself. Young ladies, if you both had to disguise yourself and you wanted no one to know it was you, what would you wear as a disguise, as a costume? A tough question. I had the luxury of weeks to think upon it. What do you think? I know it is a tough one. Well, I have a funny story to tell you. The English newspapers reported that I, the Marquis de Lafayette, disguised myself, are you ready for this? In a woman's gown. <laughs> Can you other, well, don't imagine that. <laughs> oh, do not believe everything you read or hear, especially if it is written by an Englishman about a Frenchman, no? There was no woman's gown for me. But instead, I simply disguised myself as a merchant, there to take part in a bit of commerce with the people of Spain. And not having any issue with this, they of course allowed me to pass. And true to my word, I did go from France to Spain. But what would be my ultimate destination? America. America, exactly. Now, this journey would actually take me eight long weeks. Now, have any of you been to sea for eight weeks? There's always a few. Yes, Monsieur Bravo, I, I commend you for your service, perhaps a bit of time in the Navy. No, just maybe piracy or something like that. No need to admit it here, Monsieur, but I thank you for being uh, such a great seaman. But I will tell you this. I am glad that I joined the French Army and not the French Navy simply because I was seasick nearly every day of my journey. But after those eight long weeks, as I looked over the bow of my ship, I could see the Americas for the first time. And friends, we had landed at a place called Georgetown in South Carolina. <laughs> How I recall that evening perfectly well, for even though it was evening, oh, the moon was so bright that it illuminated everything that we looked upon. So as I put my foot upon American soil for the first time, and met you, the good people of the United States, well, what do you think my first impressions were of you, the people of the United States of America? It's better not to even answer that question, Monsieur. <laughs> it was not a very good one, for you know, 
the first Americans I met here in America tried to kill me. Not a good beginning. We had landed at the plantation of a Monsieur Uge, a Benjamin Sugar, or Uge as they pronounce it there in South Carolina, an ardent patriot, but he had mistaken me and my companions for Englishmen. Can you imagine, madame, mistaking me for an Englishman? You know, in hindsight, I don't think the moon was that bright. <laughs> well, I quickly assured them that we were not, that we were there to help them in their great and glorious cause, and once they realized this, they welcomed us with open arms. But, friends, we were not there upon a holiday, were we? We needed to make our way to Philadelphia City as quickly as possible. So after bidding farewell, after thanking them for their kindness, their hospitality, and most assuredly for not killing us, well, we began that long journey. It would take us several more weeks, but eventually I would arrive in Philadelphia City, the largest city in former English North America. 40,000 souls. Now, friends, before I had departed France, I had met with an American agent by the name of Silas Dean from Connecticut, and he had promised that if I, the Marquis de Lafayette, were to come to America, I would be granted the rank of Major General in the Continental Army. So there I was, promissory note in hand, and I approached your Congress. And I said to them, honor me so by granting me a command in the Continental Army that I too might fight against tyranny. And now what does Congress say to me? There you are, you know my story well. Everyone says no to the Marquis at least once. They say thank you for coming, Monsieur le Marquis. We do appreciate you offering your services, but we don't need or even want your help. Now, can you imagine this, my friends? What I had endured up to that moment. I had left my regiment. I had disobeyed the King and Queen of France. I had traveled eight long weeks at sea, seasick nearly every day. I had nearly been killed by the first Americans I met here in America. I had traveled from South Carolina all the way to Philadelphia in the month of July. <laughs> Just to be told by your members of Congress to return back to France. Well, I ask all of you, what would you have done? Would you have returned back to France? No. Well, of course not. You would persevere. You would overcome. You would triumph in the end, just as I had done. So again, I attempt to speak to your Congress saying, very well, you will not give me a command of soldiers, but perhaps you will allow me to serve as an aide-de-camp to General Washington, as an assistant to the great man. But again, they say to me, I'm sorry, Monsieur le Marquis, but once again, this is just not possible. Besides, we don't have enough money to pay you. Well, my friends, I finally said boldly to your members of Congress, then I shall serve at my own expense. And would you know it, with those immortal words, your Congress immediately made me a general officer. I could not imagine this good fortune, for as mentioned, I was but a captain in the French army, <laughs> newly promoted simply because of my father-in-law. But here in America, I was made a major general, a general of division. I could command upwards of 5,000 soldiers. <laughs> Yet I never commanded more than 50 in my entire life, and all at the age of 19. Well, good fortune would follow me again. For that very next evening, the people of Philadelphia were holding a ball for General Washington, a party. You know all about parties, don't you, madame? <laughs> but this one held in honor of General Washington for defending the city of brotherly love. I recall when he walked into the room, for I knew precisely who he was before he spoke, even though we had never met before. It was simply by the way in which he carried himself. For to me, he was truly an aristocrat without the name, a noble without the title. He came forth, he held out his hand, he said to me, I thank you, Monsieur le Marquis, for coming to support this cause. Think of this new place as your new home. Think of the officers around you as your new family, and think of me as your new friend. And with this, I could not help myself. I immediately embraced him. <laughs> In fact, I think I embarrassed him a little bit with my French custom. But I said to him, 
From now on, mon général, j'ai du patrie, la France et les États-Unis d'Amérique. From now on, I shall have two countries, France and the United States of America, and thus my great adventure had finally begun. Now, friends, it would not be all frivolity, all merriment, all dancing minuets. Indeed not. There was a war to be fought. I would have my first taste of it in a place called Brandywine in Pennsylvania, September the 11th, 1777. I would be wounded in my left leg, but nursed back to health by the lovely Moravian girls of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I would make my way into the winter encampment at Valley Forge, where, under the tutelage of Baron von Steuben, we would transform the Continental Army into a viable fighting force that could take on the best the English had to offer. Washington would slowly, but surely, give me more and more responsibility. The battles of Gloucester, Barren Hill, indeed, Monmouth Courthouse, the battles of Rhode Island. Eventually, I would return back to France to explain myself, but return in time to take part in the great campaign that will culminate at Yorktown. Well, indeed, my friends, I recently spent two glorious weeks with His Excellency General Washington at his beloved Mount Vernon. There we reflected upon the war and the future of this young nation. We rode on to a place called Annapolis in Maryland, said goodbye to some of the officers of the Continental Line, and then we rode on to a place called Marlborough in Maryland, and that is where I said my final goodbyes to the general. But not before he said this to me. He said, Monsieur le Marquis, I sincerely believe that the easy part was winning this war. Now, of course, I, I could not imagine he would say such a thing after all of the trials and tribulations we have been forced to endure. But he explained himself by saying, I do believe that the much more difficult part will be, will be for these 13 former colonies that have now formed 13 United States, well, getting along with one another, surviving into the future. Well, my dear friends, I believe that this nation shall survive far into the future. And the reason I say that is because of the foundation that was built at the price of so much sacrifice and blood by you, the American patriot. In fact, I will go further. I will say that one day, this nation shall serve as a beacon for all other nations to look to as the truest example of freedom and of independence. God bless you all, my dear friends, and God bless this great nation of the United States of America. I thank you, my dear, dear friends, for taking the time to join me this morning and this afternoon, since we have just crossed over. And I am hopeful at this moment in time that many of you might have some questions or curiosities of me, the Marquis de Lafayette, in this year of 1784, that I could perhaps enlighten you a bit about my life up to this point. So I open the floor to all of you for any questions or curiosities that you might indeed have at this time, that I might be able to answer them. Yes, madame. How were you received back in Ah, madame was truly paying attention to my story, for she said, asked, how was I received when I returned back to France? Well, indeed, an excellent question, madame. Uh, I remained in America upon my initial visit for two years. But after those two years, I request from Washington and Congress that I might take a, a leave of absence to return back to my family and to explain myself to the king. Of course, this is granted, and I return back to France. I go to Versailles. I try to see the king, but he will not see me. In fact, madame, it's far worse. I am confined to house arrest. <laughs> but admittedly, it was house arrest at a chateau, so it was not so bad. <laughs> and it was only for eight days, but for those eight days, madame, I thought I had ruined the reputation of the Lafayette family, one that had been covered with honor and glory for a thousand years. Do you know some of my ancestors had even fought in the Crusades, bringing back the crown of thorns from the Holy Land. It was placed in the Cathedral at Notre Dame in the center of Paris. One fought alongside Jean d'Arc, Joan of Arc, 
for the relief of the city of Orléans during the Hundred Years' War. One was a Maréchal de France, the highest rank you could achieve in the French army. And of course, my beloved father was killed by the English at the Battle of Minden, August the 1st of 1759. So, madame, I thought I, Marie Joseph Polyfranche Schubert de Mautier, the Marquis de Lafayette, would be the last of the Lafayettes to bring honor and glory to the family name. But eight days pass, the king calls for me. I go to Versailles, I enter a small chamber, when all of a sudden the door flew open. It was the king himself, arms open wide, a smile upon his face. He embraced me, but he did whisper in my ear, and he said, Never disobey me again, Monsieur le Marquis. But, but why? Why had he forgiven me? I would say for several reasons. One, I had been accepted into the état major or the inner circle, the military family of Washington. Two, I had performed well upon the battlefield and been made a general officer. But three, and perhaps most importantly, madam, uh, France and America had signed the Treaty of Alliance. So we were now allied in a common cause of American freedom. So to quote an Englishman, madame, all's well that ends well. <laughs> madame. What do you think of the young Hamilton and how is your wife doing? Ah, two excellent questions. What do I think of young Hamilton and how is my wife doing? Well, I'll start with my wife. Adrienne of the de Noailles family, well, we have been married since April the 11th of 1774. You see, I've not forgotten my anniversary. Uh, when I was 16 and she was 14, so as you can imagine, it is something called an arranged marriage, not very popular anymore, uh, for good reason perhaps. Uh, well, nonetheless, what is an arranged marriage? It is really a relationship, a business transaction between two families. Uh, for example, one family might have a great and noble name that stretches back the centuries, but they have lost their fortune. <laughs> Happens more often than you think. Uh, they might look for a family with not such a great and noble name, but a great fortune, so two families can mutually benefit. But in the case of my marriage, not only did we come from two great and noble families, but two great fortunes, but most importantly, a marriage of love as well. So we have been blessed with four children, sadly, our first child, Henriette, born in 1775, well, she passed on while I was here in America. And uh, most distressful to me, but even more so to my wife, who was left back in France. But since then, we have had the birth of three more children, another daughter named Anastasia, a son whom we've named George Washington Lafayette, if you doubt my allegiance to the great man. And the youngest, recently born, well, we called her Marie Antoinette, but your newly appointed ambassador to France, Thomas Jefferson, recommended one more name, and that name, of course, was Virginie or Virginia. And that is what we have been calling her. So indeed, she fares well, and she has been so very supportive of me in all of my endeavors. As to the young Hamilton, well, Alexander Hamilton is not only my friend, he is one of my best of friends. And I met Alexander the same night that I met General Washington, the last day of July, 77, Philadelphia, in City Tavern. And we all joined what Washington called his military family, uh, along with John Lawrence and others as aides de camp. And so we would do the bidding of the General, we would be the secretary of the General. Whatever the General needed, we would perform that service for him. Eventually, when Washington would give me more responsibility, I would leave that inner circle and receive my own command. And uh, eventually, Alexander would leave as well. He would be married to the lovely Eliza, daughter of General Philip Schuyler, uh, and he was married up in Albany. Now, when I began the Virginia campaign of 1781, of course, I wanted my dear friend alongside me. So I wrote a letter to Alexander <laughs> asking if he would take a, a brief leave of absence from his new bride, and he agreed, and I met him here in Williamsburg in September of 1781. But this time, Alexander was actually under my command. And if you know anything about Alexander, he doesn't like to be under anyone's command. Well, during the siege of Yorktown, he covered himself with glory. For uh, we were assigned from my division to attack one of the earthen fortifications on the extreme left flank of Cornwallis's position. This one was called Redoubt 10. 
Now, I had selected as a commander of this attack a Frenchman, also in American uniform, uh, that had been with me from the beginning. His name, Colonel Jima, a fine officer, but uh, Alexander wanted this command more than anyone. So he did what we call in military circles, he went over my head. <laughs> and he asked General Washington if he might be granted that coveted command, and in truth, I don't think Washington could deny Hamilton anything at all. So, under cover of darkness, with unloaded muskets making the soldiers put their trust in the bayonet, he stormed Redoubt 10 and took it with such dash and such fire, covering himself for glory for all for history to look upon. So indeed, Alexander, uh, a dear, dear friend who often refers to me as a statue in search of a pedestal. <laughs> I don't know if that will stick or not. Well, nonetheless, my dear friends, I am told by my aide-de-camp that I have run out of time with you this morning afternoon, but I am hopeful that I will see you this afternoon as I'm riding about on horseback. So if you have any additional questions for me, please try and track me down and I shall endeavor to answer them for you. But before I depart with you, I am a firm believer, I want to tell you something. I am a firm believer that all of the answers to the future can be found in the past if we simply study our history. And by all of you coming to support this wonderful institution of Colonial Williamsburg, you enable us to continue to tell those stories of the past that we might create better citizens of the future. So I thank one and all, each and every one of you. Enjoy the remainder of your visit here to Williamsburg and enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you for joining me, my friends. Well, that's a wrap for this Colonial Williamsburg video. I hope you really enjoyed it. Again, to see another part of this amazing Living History Museum. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos. Check out colonialwilliamsburg.org to plan your own visit here because it's so much co cooler in real life than it is on film. Till next time, this is History Buff, TN Photobug signing out. I'm having a blast with the past.